Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Kara City, it's certainly, certainly good to be with you. Um, we are here from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, like Nathan said, there's my wife, Caitlin. There's our four kids sitting in the front row there. Um, we work with an organization called Mustard Seed Network. And our mission is to glorify God by making disciples through planting gospel-centered churches in urban Japan. We moved to Japan 15 years ago. The first two years were filled with language school, just studying Japanese was the full-time job. Then we got to be a part of a church plant in the city of Nagoya. Um, that city is the third largest city in Japan. It's uh, 9 million people, so think Chicago or Paris. And then two years after that, we moved to a city called Osaka, uh, 19 million people in the Osaka metro area, a huge city. We were there for eight years, and then we moved to Tokyo in uh, 2019, and we uh, got ready to plant a church there in this city in, in 2020. We decided a great time to launch that church would be March 1st, 2020. That was, that was the date that we set on the calendar. So like you, we are also a pandemic church plant, and yet God has been very good and grown that church, and we've seen God do some awesome things there. So we now have uh, seven church plants as a part of our church planting network there. Um, uh, the newest one was planted this year in the city of Hiroshima, and uh, more and more people are hearing about Jesus. And so I want to say thank you, because I'm actually in front of you right now. I'm glad that we can be in front of you so I can tell you in person, thank you uh, for the support that you give, because people are hearing the gospel because of the generosity of Karis City. So Romans 1.16 tells us that the gospel is the power unto salvation. And it's the power unto salvation for people in Tokyo. It's the power unto salvation for everyone in Texas. And we're going to look at the gospel from Exodus chapter 32. If you would go to Exodus chapter 32 uh, in your Bible, on your phone, whatever you use, we're going to jump around um, that chapter. But before we do, I'd like to pray. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We believe that these things written in your word, that they actually happened. We believe this tells us about you, so help us to learn more about you. Help us to learn how to please you. Help us to learn about what you've done uh, to set us free and to give us new life in Jesus. Pray that you'll be glorified. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So a little story, 14 Christmases ago, Christmas 2008, I had to travel on Christmas Day uh, to Tokyo to pick up some people from the airport who were flying in. At that time, we lived in Nagoya, uh, but they kind of thought, well, Japan, it's kind of all the same. I'll fly to Tokyo. Can you come pick us up? Now, I don't know if that makes sense, uh, Nagoya and Tokyo, how, how far apart they are, but it'd be like someone saying, hey, I'm coming to Texas, so I'm flying into DFW. Can you come and pick me up? And so I'm thinking in Christmas, I have to travel all the way to Tokyo, and uh, it was just kind of a hard time in life. It was our first year there. So I'm in language school, and language school is not fun. Uh, you go and you work on something that you're really bad at every day, and you, you talk and you sound like a kindergartner, and, and then you just feel really silly and you feel dumb every day. Uh, my wife was pregnant with our firstborn. Uh, she was on bed rest. I was in a cycle of perpetually failing the Japanese driver's test over and over again. It was just kind of a hard time in life. And I was really sick of not being able to communicate uh, the gospel, which is why we moved to Japan. So Christmas Eve, before I'm about to jump on this train, Christmas Eve, I prayed and it went like this. I said, God, I'd like you to give me a Christmas present. Uh, tomorrow, on the train, give me someone to share the gospel with in English, please, amen. And that was the prayer. The next day, I went and I stood on the platform and we're waiting for the, uh, the bullet train to pull up uh, so that I can get on the train. While I'm standing there waiting on the train, I have a tap on my shoulder. I turn around, there's a Japanese woman who's tapped me on the shoulder and she says, excuse me, are you an English teacher? 
And I said, uh, no, I'm actually a Japanese student. Um, I'm studying Japanese right now. And uh, she says, oh, that's so interesting. I used to be studying English in, in, uh, in Chicago when I went to the University of Chicago. And even though I was surrounded by people who speak English, I realized not everyone wants to practice with you. So I bet you want an opportunity to practice Japanese. Why don't we sit next to each other on the train and I'll help you practice Japanese? And I said, sure. <laughs> so we sit down on the train and she says, so what do you do? I said, well... <laughs> I'm actually a pastor, and uh, we would like to, in, in the future, start a church. And she says, a Christian church, like a Christian pastor? I said, yeah. She said, that's interesting. You know, I've never actually heard the main beliefs of Christianity before. Why don't you share them with me in English, and then I'll teach you how to say them in Japanese so that you can then teach them to other people? And I said, okay. <laughs> and, so I, then I get to tell her all about Jesus and share the gospel message uh, with this woman. And I couldn't believe that God just gift-wrapped this opportunity for us. But I think uh, asking God for opportunities to, to share the gospel is a prayer that he likes to answer. And so then after I shared the gospel message, she said, okay, that's pretty interesting. But wouldn't it be easier for people to become Christians if they didn't have to believe in Jesus only. Like, I think the message would be more acceptable if people could be Buddhists and Christians at the same time. So, church, what do you think? <laughs> that would make Christianity more likable to people, right? But I can think of one person who wouldn't like the idea of worshiping both God and false gods at the same time. Who's that? It's God. Yeah. So you've been in Exodus. God has saved the people out of uh, Egypt. He's led them into the wilderness. He's provided for them in the wilderness. And then in chapter 19, uh, God makes a covenant with Israel. He says, I'll be your God. And he asks Israel to follow his commands. All the people say, yes, we promise to follow your commands. Uh, he gives them the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. The first two of the Ten Commandments are this. Hey, uh, it says here here's in verse 3 of chapter 20, in Japanese it says, You shall have no other gods before me. Second, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now the carved images mentioned here in the second commandment, that would include things like statues of Buddha which are all over Japan. This includes praying to ancestors, which happens throughout Japan in most households. This includes the thousands of gods of Shintoism, the Japanese folk religion. So remember, these laws, they're given to God's people as a covenant with his people, like a marriage covenant, which is what I explained to the woman on the train. So she says, why can't we just have people be Buddhists and Christians at the same time? And I said, well... For Christians, we believe that our relationship with God is like a marriage relationship. And she actually just finished my thought. She said, ah, so of course you must be monogamous, just married to one spouse. I said, yes, that's right. This is why we worship God only, only worshiping Jesus. In today's Bible passage, in Exodus 32, the story of Israel, uh, we see the story of Israel worshiping a golden calf. So we see Israel not stay committed to their God, their husband. And not only that, they distorted who God is and worshiped something else, uh, something else completely different than God in God's name. And here's the main point that we're going to learn. is that all sin is a betrayal of God, which God forgives for the sake of his glory. Now, for many today, uh, you may not believe in God, so the idea that we sin against God when we do something wrong, uh, that, that, that may sound surprising. Like, a sin in atheism doesn't exist because absolute morality doesn't exist to atheists, and also God does not exist, so you can't sin against God in atheism. A sin in Buddhism is not a betrayal towards a loving God. It might get you some bad karma for yourself, but it's not, it's not a betrayal against another person. 
But Christianity is far less individualistic. It tells us that we are made for relationship with God, and therefore sin damages a relationship with God. So here's the story, Exodus 32, and I'm going to make four observations along the way. So if you're a note taker, we're going to have one through four. Get ready for that. In Exodus, they're led out of slavery in Egypt. They come to Mount Sinai. This is where God gives Moses the law. While God is giving Moses the law up on Mount Sinai, he's there for 40 days to receive the law, and during that time, the people get restless. Here's Exodus 32, verses 1 through 6. It says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Pause right there. Where did they get this jewelry to make this idol? Uh, When God was inflicting the 10 plagues on Egypt in chapters 11 and 12, the Egyptians were giving the Israelites their gold and silver and jewelry as this way to say, here, take this and just please go, leave us alone, here you go. Not only that, if you go all the way back to uh, chapter 3, when God is calling Moses, uh, God tells Moses, go to Egypt, uh, say to Pharaoh, let my people go, and then God says, I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and when you go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. So the reason that the Israelites have this gold and silver jewelry is because of God's power. It was a blessing from God in a way that God... uh, freed them from slavery in Egypt. And now they've taken a blessing from God and they're about to use it for sin. So often we have blessings from God, like a talent, uh, wealth, an opportunity, and then we use it for sin. Continue on the story, verse four. It says, and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. And he made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh, the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So in verse 1, the people grew impatient And thought Moses had died or abandoned them because he's been up on this mountain for 40 days. Does impatience ever lead us to sin against God? I'm impatient with God's provision of money, so maybe I'll fudge on the taxes. I'm impatient with God's provision of a spouse, so I'll pursue sexual immorality. I'm impatient with people, so maybe I'll say things that I shouldn't say. Now, Aaron, he's supposed to be the leader in this situation, but he completely caved to the pressure of the people. And we have to ask ourselves, do the expectations of of society around us, do the pressures of people around us ever cause us to sin? Do social pressures keep you from opening up to the possibility of following Jesus? Do we take our marching orders from social media or the news? And that goes for the right and the left here in the United States. No one can say, hey, those conservatives, they're trying to brainwash us with media. And no one can say, hey, those liberals, they're trying to brainwash us with media. Both sides are trying to influence people. Everyone is pushing a message. And the Bible is your center. The Bible is our true north. Jesus is the truth. We run to him for a brain detox. Look closely at verse 4, which says, The people then proclaimed regarding the golden calf that Aaron made, These are your gods 
just a ridiculous statement. These are your gods, this golden calf that I made five minutes ago. This is the one who brought you out of Egypt. And here's the first point from this story. Number one, the culture of the world can negatively influence our theology, our understanding of who God is. The people had lived in Egypt for 400 years. A little bit of Egypt will wear off on you over 400 years. And in Egypt, they had a pantheon of gods, all these various gods, many gods and idols. And look at how the Israelites say, these are your gods, plural, implying multiple gods, just like the Egyptian worship. Further, they made a calf. In Egypt, they worshiped and deified cows, like you can see in this image here. The ideas of polytheism and the belief in multiple gods, the idea of glorifying and worshiping a cow as a symbol of strength and fertility, those ideas, they crept into the minds of the Israelites and affected their understanding of the one true God and how to please God. So we need God's word to correct our theology and practice. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. In the New Testament, it tells Christians, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. By living in the world, we have a temptation to conform to it, and we need God's word which is above all cultures and from God, we need it to renew our minds and to transform us. And listen, friends, you cannot be transformed by God's word if you're not reading it. And there's zero excuse to not read it. We have apps, apps on phones for and every device that you could possibly find, free audio apps. We could listen to the Bible on your commute, Here, let's get practical. I recommend the ESV uh, Bible app. It has an audio function. You can listen to someone with a good old American accent or a Northern Irish accent, which is pretty fun. Uh, You can download for free the CSB, which has also a free Bible uh, uh, audio function to listen to on your commute. If we have even one streaming service, then we have no excuse to not spend time in the word of life asking God to change us and to form us. Your mind will be influenced by something. Let's make sure that our minds are not influenced by the news or social media or the latest author or artist, but by the eternal word of the living God. Go straight to the source. There's a lot of great things out there, but go straight to the source. Go to the Bible. Take in God's word as your daily bread. The Israelites, they should have remembered the law that they had proclaimed to them. They should have remembered those Ten Commandments and remembered there is one God and he doesn't like idols. The Israelites allowed the Egyptian culture of pagan idol worship to affect their theology But we have to ask, how have our cultures influenced our perceptions of God? I know that I've had to untangle cultural values from Christianity in in the United States, and then I had to do it all over again in Japan. We need the Bible to correct us. I am prone to get it wrong. We will think wrong thoughts about God without God revealing himself to us. Let me say that again. If left to our own, when we say, well, I think, you know, it kind of seems good to me, if we just try to reason about this on our own, we will think wrong thoughts about God without God's word to correct us. It is good that we have a Bible. Notice the Israelites did not say, you know what? We're done worshiping God, the I am, Yahweh. We're only worshiping cows now. From now on, we're Bessie worshipers. No, they don't say that. They said, this is our God. They distorted him and thought they were still worshiping him. It was a false image of their own creation that they were calling God. If the God that you are worshiping never tells you to confess sin and repent, you are worshiping a God of your own creation. If the God you worship is only working for your comfort or your ease or your health or your wealth and never restricts your freedom, 
then you're worshiping a God of your own creation. If the God that we worship agrees with all of our values, all of our ideas, all of our opinions, then we are worshiping a God of our own creation. If you, are th- if you think that you are worshiping a God and it's nothing like the God that is holy and glorious and powerful and beyond comprehension and can make the earth tremble with his presence, but is rather just a cheerleader for our own dreams, then we are bowing down to a golden calf. In Shintoism, this Japanese folk religion, the gods are many and they don't have great character. Like they fight, they lie, they try to trick each other. And they're also really, really small. They're only over certain areas, like over this tree, over this element. They're not like the God of the universe in the Bible that exists over all things. And the gods of Shintoism and the teacher of Buddhism, they do not seek a personal relationship with people. And therefore, many adherents to Buddhism and Shintoism, they just kind of occasionally visit a temple or go to a shrine, occasionally pray when facing certain pressures in life, when they have a big test coming up or a big uh, presentation at work or something like that. But Christians are called to love the one true God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to follow him and walk with him every day, hour, every second of our lives. If we find ourselves content with these small times of prayer, small sacrifices for God, occasional, optional weekly worship, it may be that our God looks more like the pagan idols over in Japan where we serve, who are small gods, not worthy of worship. Here's point number two from from this story. Sin leads us to not know how to live. So point number one is that sin will, and the culture will affect our understanding of God's nature, what God is like. But number two, it affects our understanding of how to please God. So I want you to look at chapter 32, verses five and six again. In verse five, Aaron builds an altar to sacrifice to the calf and proclaims, hey, let's have a feast for Yahweh, the name of God, the I am. The Lord. It's in all caps in your English Bible. And it almost seems like Aaron is trying to convince himself and convince the people that this horrible sin of idol worship and cheating on their true husband, God, that they're actually doing it for the Lord. But Aaron should have just looked at the plain words of God that he had given them on Mount Sinai to know how to actually please God and do God's will. People today will say, hey, I really want to know God's will for my life. I want to know, what does God want me to do? But here's the thing. We can read God's will for our life right here. We know that God wants us to love God, love people, forgive, speak the gospel, make make disciples of all nations, help the poor, help orphans, help widows, so forth. There's a lot in there. And in verse 6, It says the people sacrificed to the golden calf uh, and made sacrifices to that calf that they were supposed to make to the one true God of the universe. They then ate and drank and rose up to play. Now the word play, it has this flirtatious connotation to it. And the original Hebrew word that's in here, it was used in intimate contexts like in Genesis chapter 26 verse 8, which is describing Isaac in an intimate setting with his wife. So we have this scene of God's people in the wilderness eating, drinking, and then engaging in promiscuous behavior in a huge party that they say they are doing for God. Later in Uh, Exodus 32, verse 25, it says the people had broken loose. They lost control of themselves. They've gotten carried away at a party. People often live contrary to God's word and then do these mental gymnastics to convince themselves that God actually blesses their actions. Here's the third lesson that we see today. Sin is shocking. This is very simple, but uh, as we read this story, I think we are supposed to be shocked by how stupid and terrible the sin was. These people saw God work the ten plagues. 
These people saw God split the Red Sea. They saw manna on the ground. They saw water coming out of a rock. They saw God provide in these incredible ways. And now they're worshiping this DIY homemade golden calf with drinking and promiscuity. And it gets even crazier and almost laughable in verses 21 to 24. It says, And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, how they're set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, and Moses, you were taking a long time, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any of you who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. I threw the gold in the fire and the cow popped out have got to be some of the stupidest words in the Bible. It's like, no, Aaron, let's actually roll back the tape, go to verse 4 where it says, you intentionally fashioned a calf with an engraving tool. That's enough to establish intentionality and premeditation. Sin makes people lie and say stupid, delusional things. So this sin of Israel... It's shocking. It's shocking to us, but all sin should shock us. See, we're often shocked when we hear about those big, big sins, right? So we hear someone who has a really good family and then they had an affair, or we hear about someone being jailed for embezzlement. We can't believe it, but all sin should be shocking to us because all sin is committed against a holy God who has provided everything for us. All sin is a betrayal against the creator who made us. Lies, gossip, coveting, vanity, vanity, just look, liking the way you look in your selfie or in the mirror, vanity, lust that nobody else knows about except for God. Those things should feel terrible to us. We should not be able to tolerate even a little bit of sin in our lives. It should all seem ridiculous in light of how good God has been to us. And Moses, he was disgusted by their sin. Look at verses 19 and 20. It says, as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. Go ahead and underline burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He then took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Moses' anger burned hot at sin, which is a healthy reaction towards sin. And you can notice he destroyed the golden calf in three stages. Stage number one, he burned it. Two, I'm going to grind it to powder. Three, he made the people drink it so that it would pass through them into human waste, so that that false god that they used to replace the one true god was totally desecrated, dishonored, and destroyed. And then look at God's reaction to Israel's sin in verses 32, I'm sorry, chapter 32, verses 9 and 10. It says, Yahweh, the Lord, said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and that I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. So God is ready to just give them over to the just penalty for their sin, which is death. The first sin In the Garden of Eden, it brought death. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. It would be fair if God wiped them all out. But Moses prays to God to ask God to not wipe out the nation of Israel. And I want you to look at how he asks. Here's how he asks God in verses 11 to 14. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. 
and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he has spoken of bringing on his people. So Moses appeals to God to save his people, but he does not appeal to God to save the people because they were good and lovable people. He prays, God, save them because other nations are not going to think highly of you if you just brought them out into the wilderness to kill them. They're going to think that you're evil. He prays, God, remember your promises to their forefather Abraham. You said, I'll make your nations like the star, or your descendants like the stars. So basically, Moses prays and asks God to save the people, not because they're worth saving, but for the sake of God's glory. This is point number four. God shows mercy for the sake of his glory. This is so important for us to understand because we cannot think that God's number one reason to save us is because we are lovable. Does God love us? Yes, God loves you. But he ultimately saves us for his glory. And this is really good news for us because if God saved us because we are just so lovable, what about when we do something unlovable? What about when we sin? Then we would have to worry that God will not save us when we mess up and sin and do something unlovable. And we'd be in this constant state of fear. But God saves us for the sake of his glory. He sent Jesus to die for our sins on the cross and to rise from the dead to pay for our sins for the sake of his glory. So he will be glorified through sinners like us being saved to eternal life with him. And when we mess up and do something unlovable, remember that God's mercy to you does not change because he is ultimately saving you for the sake of his glory. Ultimately, we can rejoice because of what one British preacher, Charles Spurgeon, said. He said, we are great sinners, but Christ is a better Savior. Sin is horrible and shockingly evil in light of God's goodness. But even more shocking is God's goodness, mercy, and love to send his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for our horrible sins. We've worshipped golden calves in the form of money and power and fame and comfort and security and selfishness. But Moses is not the one who intercedes for us. Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus saved us from slavery, not slavery in Egypt, but slavery to sin and death. Jesus took the evil of our sins on himself and he died for those sins in our place. And the hot anger of God toward our sin burned hot towards Jesus on the cross for my sin. He paid for sin, he rose to life three days later, and he offers you eternal life. So what do you have to do to be saved? Repent and believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then it's a free gift to you. There is one God. He loves you, and he calls you into a covenant relationship. Let's worship him only. Let's worship him in ways that he commanded us, ways that please him. How is God calling us today to faithfully serve our Savior who set us free from bondage to sin and death and hell? Let me pray.